Good afternoon. This is Larry Olson with Olson Engineering and Olson Instruments located in Denver, that is Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and with a branch office in Rockville, Maryland, near Washington, D.C. I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Patrick Miller, our senior engineer and NDE project manager, also in our Colorado office. So our topic today, the paper is on remote radar monitoring for bridge load testing and stay cable forces. The imaging by interferometric survey system is manufactured by IDS Geo Radar, who's in Pisa, Italy, and with a branch office in Golden, Colorado. It's a system for dynamic and static monitoring of structures, as well as landslides, dams, and slopes. Uh, on the left is the structural monitoring system, and shown most typically applied on bridges, but can also be used on buildings and wind turbines. And this system on the right, you can see it's sitting on a rail that goes back and forth in 20 millimeter steps to get static displacements out to two and a half miles with a very good accuracy of uh, four thousandths of an inch of movements of landslides, dams, and slopes. But the system on the left is even more accurate to four ten thousandths of an inch and goes out to a thousand meters statically, 500 meters dynamically. But if it's a concrete bridge, you have to mount aluminum corner reflectors to reflect the, ele the electromagnetic wave energy of the radar system. So it's sending and receiving with two transmitting antennas, as you'll learn. If it's a steel bridge, maybe the steel beams are large enough to reflect without any corner reflectors. So the basics of interferometric dis radar displacement measurements is you're sending from a transmitting an air horn antenna the wave out, and it is reflecting from a reflector back. And from one sampling time to the next, if there's a change in phase, you can calculate the displacement as you're reflecting target moves. So that's equal to the wavelength divided by four times pi times the change in phase. So I mentioned it's very accurate with 0 0.004 ten thousandths of an inch of displacement accuracy and wavelengths are very short, helps to be accurate displacement at 0.75 inches. So it is high frequency radar, 17.1 to 17.3 gigahertz where structural radar is nominally one to say three gigahertz. So it's even higher frequency than structural radar. So this airborne radar, you, as it goes out every 0.75 meters, the system allows you to see reflectors and discretize them. You can see multiple reflectors at once. The power of each reflector is reflected as echo intensity, and it's shown as peaks versus distance. So it's also a range finder, if you will. And you can see what your strong reflectors and correlate and check that with a simple distance finder, laser pointer type, to see and be sure of what is your reflector at that distance. So on a bridge, you go underneath it, you'd like to see a five horizontal to one vertical or steeper angle to get the best resolution, but it can go as flat as 10 to one, pretty good resolution. Uh, it's a line of sight, speed of light, straight line reflection of the displacement. So you resolve that if it's a bridge into a vertical component with trigonometry to get the vertical component of displacement. If it's a building, you would go for the uh, cosine horizontal component of displacement or a wind turbine. So that's what you're looking at, its motions on the tower mass as we've done. So what are the advantages and disadvantages that I've assessed? Well, it's you can carry out the survey without touching the bridge. You could just have to have it at a stable place in the proximity of it. And whatever's in the antenna beam red window, if you will, is resolved. The antennas allow you to vary from a narrow beam to a wide beam, depending on their mechanical shape. Very good accuracy, out to four ten thousandths of an inch at 1,000 meters away. The dynamic vibration response can go up to 100 hertz and closer, but even at 500 meters away, 1,640 feet, you can go up to 40 hertz resolution of the vibrations in a dynamic sense. Run it day or night, even in bad weather, uh, you. The landslide system in particular is hooked up wirelessly to transmit data back for long-term monitoring of say a, a dam or slope that you want to monitor. And it only takes very quick to take the data with the IFSS, which is for structures. So one of the first projects we got involved in and did it jointly with uh, interferometric radar testing with IDS Geo Radar with Columbia University and New York City DOT participants in the paper and access, it's a New York City DOT bridge. So the Club Manhattan Bridge is shown here, we're underneath it, going to be testing that way. The Brooklyn Bridge is in the background, there's Manhattan. 
Uh, Dr. Smythe, one of the authors, along with Dr. Yanoff, myself, and Lawrence O'Meara of IDS, uh, did GPS monitoring prior to our investigation because they had a problem with the bridge twisting too much in loading of trains and wind. So here's a view from the side. You see the suspension cables, very heavily traveled bridge uh, as it crosses from Brooklyn to Manhattan. You're looking at the Brooklyn side on the right. This shows the traffic loading, a couple of top traffic lanes, center traffic lanes, and side traffic lanes at the bottom level of the subway trains, which of course are the heaviest and the biggest loading of the bridge. It was twisting up to nine feet in extreme weather and train loading combination, high winds, et cetera. And they wanted to stiffen it because of concerns over fatigue and long-term performance. So they put in a torque tube stiffening system, cost about 900 million over 10 years, but it greatly reduced the twist. It was successful. And this just shows some of the GPS monitoring done by Columbia University showing nominally 300 millimeter displacements on a time window, in this case, about uh, up to 3,600 seconds, but it's basically showing half hour data. And what you've got here is spikes when the trains go by. And that's showing Brooklyn bound and Manhattan bound, nominally 300 millimeter one foot displacements in this particular data set. So we set up underneath it uh, on the Brooklyn side, stable ground, and shot out looking underneath and these cross beams are so big, they turned out to be excellent reflectors because we could see as far as we could see over the top of this pier was what we could monitor. And then we also monitored the cantilevers on the side edge here because we wanted to check them as well uh, to see about twisting. So this shows the many beams that we saw, these cross beams, about 55 of them, the many reflectors present with distance. Here we are back at the pier going out to here. And this zoom in on those peaks, they really are the most powerful reflectors. So we were confident we were monitoring the displacements of these beams. And there you can see the cantilevers again that we also monitored by shifting the unit over to light up with them. So in a half hour of data here, we had displacements of 300, 350 millimeters as the trains went by at mid span. And just to show one result, well, we actually have 55 results. Uh, so we'll see in a second, but here is an expansion of that data. Uh, it's four minutes of data now, instead of half an hour, you can see a train's coming along, it displaces down 300 millimeters, the train goes by and it settles back down. And that's again at mid span. So that was a 13.3 inch, 33.8 centimeter peak to peak displacement. So here is the results of all 55 cross beams plot on top of each other over this half hour period. So you can see there's a bit of skew of the data because it's moving through in time, the trains are, but all the data is there and you can pull out each one because of the discretizing of the data into 0.75 meter bins by the system. So a simple comparison of peak to peak vertical deflection was made during our half day of monitoring, it took about an hour to set up or it went very fast. And the center deflection is plotted as a solid line with a peak to peak at each of these 55 beam locations are plotted. The edge deflection of the 55 cantilever beams extending out are plotted and it shows only 50 millimeters more peak to peak deflection. Again, confirming there's not very much twist left. It's uh, performing very similarly. That's only two inches of difference in the data. So when the trains were not there, you get the natural vibrations caused by wind, as well as the traffic vibrations from trucks and cars. And so these are those vibrations shown in time, uh, again, at bit span here on that cross beam. And when you go to the FFT, fast Fourier transforms to get the natural frequencies, you can see three peaks at low frequencies as you'd expect, of the fundamental, the second mode, and third mode of vibration of 0 0.23, 0 0.30, 0 0.49 hertz. This was related to the peak at really low frequencies, was related to the slow span deformation from the train going by and the train passages. It wasn't structural. So shifting gears slightly, this is going to show the IBIS S system applied for you know, comparison with a conventional load test. Uh, this was a part of an FHWA long-term bridge performance monitoring study with conventional load testing done by Drexel University. And we did 
a IBIS has monitoring on this New Jersey Route 23 bridge in Wayne Township in Northern New Jersey. So the specific girder that we monitored for comparison with Rexel results was girder 2W3 in span two southbound. So here's the system set up. You can see the antennas, the horn antennas real well now. Uh, wide in this direction means it's a narrow beam horizontally. Thin in this direction, the vertical direction means it's a broad beam vertically. So your aperture is very large vertically, but narrower horizontally to focus on the reflectors of interest. There's a control PC. It's just a ruggedized field tough book, uh, any ruggedized notebook, Windows. A 12 volt power supply connected to it. This shows again those corner reflectors. They were being installed at three points along girder 2W3. You're looking over the top of the unit uh, with the air horn antennas. So Drexel. Uh, did quite a bit of load testing on this project. It was the main, their main focus was on the conventional load testing, both dynamic and static. And they had monitoring points, and this is girder three of the second span going southbound, where this is considered the north, three quarter span loading, half span loading, quarter span loading roughly, but there's a skew to it. So this shows that string potentiometer, the string <clears throat> went down to a weight on the ground for monitoring the displacements as the trucks were moved out on there statically and some trucks were driven across, of course, for dynamic loading as well. But it ended up being a 460 kip load, at the, as I mentioned, three quarter half and quarter points. And we had on the backside mounted a corner reflector. So it's basically the same area, not exactly the same location, but very close. So here's the uh, air horn antenna view again, looking at where the corner reflectors are being installed, have been installed in this case, and showing their actual locations on girder 2W3 for span 2W. So just background traffic measurements were done first for ambient traffic displacements and fundamental frequencies at the mid-span corner reflector. The big spike is a truck going by. It shows an fundamental frequency at 2.76 hertz. This is zero to about 20 hertz. There's the resonant frequency for that girder. So this shows the results of the static load tests uh, done with the IBIS S to monitor it of the corner reflectors. And at three quarter span, the R3, which is the reflector right below the loading, deflected the most, about six tenths of an inch, then at mid-span was the next most reflection from R2 and R1 at the quarter span was the least. As it goes to mid-span, the displacement was the greatest here at R2, then R3 and R1. Then at quarter span, interestingly enough, uh, because of the skew of the bridge, the displacement was not greatest at R1, which is right below the quarter loading, as you might have guessed but actually greatest at R2 because of the geometry of the bridge. And it was the least at R3, which is the furthest from the loading. So comparing the results of the IBIS S displacement measurements and the string potentiometer displacement measurements on the same span and girder uh, shows very similar results. The maximum displacement measured at three quarter span was 0.57 inches, 0.58, 0.53 with a potentiometer, a difference of 5 hundredths of an inch, the difference is small at mid-span loading as a hundredth of an inch and a difference of 0 0.03 hundredths of an inch at the quarter span loading. So very good agreement between the two systems, not exactly the same measurement point, but very close to each other. So shifting gear slightly, another application of the IBIS S system is to measure tension forces and state cables, which uh, some people are installing structural health monitoring and putting accelerometers on state cables. Um, more commonly, they might install them after the fact, just for checking, or you can check a cable at a time with a Doppler laser vibrometer. Well, but that means you're checking cable at a time. Of course, you have access issues to get up, install the cables uh, on the cables, access issues to install the accelerometers and all the cables to bring the signals back down. So what are the advantages of the IPSS? As you would guess, it gives you static and dynamic displacement measurements with very ac good accuracy non-contacting, nothing needs to be installed, no traffic shutdown if you're installed under the bridge or beside the bridge towers in a safe area or other stable location. 
You get simultaneous measurements on a large number of cables, line of sight, speed of light measurements. Wrap it, set it up, and take it down. So you're doing uh, more measurements quicker with easier installation with the IVS S system than the accelerometers or laser displacement vibrometers. So the first application of this was researched uh, by IDS GeoRadar with the professor, Carmelo Gentile of the Polytechnico di Milano, the Milan Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Department of Structural Engineering in Italy. In a 2010 paper, he's written on both bridge monitoring and modal vibration measurements, as well as the state cable applications. But in this paper was published, and he identified the amplitude of cable vibrations and displacements, got the natural frequencies and the cable damping factors, and used that information to again predict the tension and operating strain of the cables. So here's an example of a brand new bridge that would have had the cables recently installed being constructed, uh, monitored using the 15 degree antennas, shooting up to monitor the cables from down near pier level. And this is displacement versus time vibration data and the range profile. The cables stand out because they're the only steel, if you line it correctly, that you're looking at. So they stand out in areas, very strong reflectors. So here's a comparison with accelerometers. The accelerometer is mounted on there with a solid line versus the dashed line of the IBIS system. You can't see really a difference in the acceleration where the displacements were differentiated from uh, displacement to velocity to acceleration to compare with the accelerometer direct measurements. So very similar results. Uh, there's the piezoelectric accelerometers mounted on these as well. In the frequency domain with the FFT analysis, you can see the peaks are very clear. Fundamental, second mode, third mode, fourth mode, fifth mode, and sixth mode in the IBIS results from zero to 25 Hertz. The accelerometer has fairly clear peaks, but not always at higher frequencies as clear in this case as the IBIS. So we'll talk more about the calculation of this in another slide. But basically, as you looked at the resonant frequencies, the fundamental was 3.5. 91 for the IBIS versus 3.81 for the accelerometer, very close. You can see they were quite close. The tension forces, accordingly, were also very similar because they're a function of the length of the cables, the mass density per unit length, the fundamental frequency, all of this multiplied out to calculate these tension forces. So recently we did a project uh, on a bridge, state cable bridge. You can see shining up at the cables done at night. And you can see that we had very clear reflectors from the first cable to the north, the second cable to the north, et cetera. And there are even higher reflectors beyond six, but we're gonna focus on the first six further away. This is distance or range and the power or signal to noise ratio of the reflections of those cables. So working quite well to pick up the data. This is some ambient vibration data for those six cables over a 10 second period from traffic and wind on the bridge. Uh, this shows only the closest cable to the IBIS unit because on that cable, there was mounted an accelerometer for comparison. So in this case, uh, that's in displacements and it's not moving that much. This is like uh, 10th of a millimeter at the top of the scale, minus 0.2 millimeters at the bottom of the scale. So here's the response in velocity units, differentiated, and finally in acceleration units. So you can digitally uh, differentiate the data to get, if you want, velocity and acceleration responses in addition to the displacements. So the resonant frequencies for these cables are all plotted together here. And from zero to 20 Hertz is the scale. Interestingly enough, and as expected, the longer cables have lower resonant frequencies, which is to be expected. So looking at the first cable to the north again, cable 1N, the dominant frequency, the fundamentals at 2.7 Hertz, the peak, then there are second mode resonances at five and 7.2 Hertz, uh, nominally multiples of that frequency. Uh, as expected, uh, damping is not accounted for here, but we're using the fundamental frequency. So what you've got then in accelerometer is mounted on cable 1N. 
This is uh, a FFT result of it for time versus acceleration response data, 2.71 Hertz fundamental frequency, very similar 5.2 and 7.3 Hertz second and third mode resonant frequencies. So agreed very well with the IBIS S resonances. And now the calculation of tensile force. It's easier to see it on this slide than the earlier one. This is for the fundamental resonance for state cable 1N as measured with the IBIS S. The tension equals four times the mass density per unit length rho times the effective free length of the cable quantity squared times the fundamental frequency squared. It came out at 858 kips. So the IBIS S calculated a cable stress of 128 kips per square inch. That compares with the design cable stress 118 kips per square inch. So the design engineers, the bridge engineers can see how the actual forces are in the cables, of course, versus design forces, and also the forces that were uh, put in at the time they did the hydraulic jacking of the state cables in the first place. So in summary, uh, the IBIS has capabilities and applications. You can do very rapid ridge load tests because it's quick to set up, but very good accuracy, non-contacting displacement accuracy to four ten thousandths of an inch. Corner reflectors are often needed, always needed on concrete bridges. Can be optional on steel bridges, but sometimes they're useful if you have too much steel, like occurred on the uh, Drexel load test bridge. There was a pan deck of steel. So modal vibration measurements can be done from zero to 100 hertz. Uh, vibration monitoring can be done to predict stay cable forces from ambient vibrations, or you can impact them if it's that quiet, not typically a problem. And that measures fundamental frequencies though on many cables at a time. So it's much faster, more economical and effective to do that. And excellent correlation was shown between resonant frequencies of state cables from the IBIS S and accelerometers. There are other applications. You can do static and dynamic horizontal displacement monitoring applications for say wind turbines, which we've done in buildings. So remember, it is a line of sight, speed of light technology. It requires reflectors be visible and clearly identifiable in your data. So line up your system to see reflectors and cables. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much to all of you for your time and attention today virtually. Look forward to seeing everybody in person next year. Be happy to answer any questions that might occur in the chat or that are asked. Um, look forward to hearing from you and have a great virtual IBC conference.